Um, last week, uh, we started uh, the season of Advent. It was the first week of Advent and um, had a kind of like a, you know, kind of an introduction to what we're going to talk about in this series. Um, am I a little juiced, by the way? Do I feel juiced to you? Yeah, can you turn me down a little bit? Because I'm, I'm really soft right now. I'm going to get louder today. Um, not, not in a bad way. I'm just saying I'm going to get louder. Uh, so uh, what well, we started, uh, we're, we're calling the series The Best Gifts. And uh, I was glad you got to see, we're going to show those devotionals that we showed uh, every single week that you saw um, at that gathering uh, last week. But, and it's really kind of traditionally what we talk about at Advent, hope and, and peace and joy and love. But in the midst of the time that we find ourselves in, almost two years into a pandemic, it just feels like the grind continues. And what's interesting, um, it, this is just me personally, is it is harder to recognize that of the gifts that are actually right in front of you in the midst of hard times. And because you see, you're so consumed with, it sometimes it feels like constant crisis mode. That's what I've almost felt like for two years. It's like constant crisis mode with wrestling with all sorts of things. Um, and, and obviously for mentioning what happened uh, with the English family, but you know, tons of friends of mine have passed away from COVID. Uh, tons more have passed away from things not related to COVID in the last almost two years. I mean, I think, I think I'm, you know, I've lost 15 people in the last two years um, to all sorts of things. It's just brutal. Not counting, you know, some of you know my own physical health has been crazy roller coaster ride. It still is right now. We're okay. Um, so I thought maybe the Buckeyes lost were going to put me in a tailspin physically, but it didn't. I'm not that kind of fan, thankfully. But, uh, but I mean, it's been, it's been really difficult, you know, with a lot of things where people can't see family, you know, whether they get COVID themselves struggle with it, um, job loss, you name it. And there's all sorts of things that happen. And, and what we want to do in this series is kind of embrace the gifts that are right in the midst of us because the Christmas story is the perfect story for that because that is what was happening in the midst of the first century. Uh, well, I say the first century because Jesus came in the scene. But, like, when that happened, I mean, it was one of the most crazy times for history. Um, and so we want to walk through these, what these gifts were of this baby showing up. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Matthew chapter 1. That's where we're going to sit today. This is the part that a lot of people like to skip in the Bible because it's a bunch of names. We're going to read a bunch of names today. I'm going to see about how many I can mispronounce. Um, but that is the text today, and, it's, and we're going to talk about hope. And I know it's going to seem odd, like, how do we talk about hope by reading a bunch of names? But that's why we're doing teaching today. It's going to be a lot of fun. So we're going to read the first 17 verses today of Matthew chapter 1. Um, and this is how Matthew starts the good news. He says, this is the genealogy. I'm going to read this from the NIV. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Amminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jeho Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. And after the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Alakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Elihud, Elhud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, 
the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Let's pray together. God, I pray that as we walk through a brief (laughs) lineage, that we see the hope that is within it of this baby being born and why that matters. God, I pray that that hope um, would be evident um, to our hearts and our eyes and our ears to know that it's right in front of us right now. And so, God, I pray that you help, um, help us listen to your Holy Spirit today. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. You know, when we talk about the best gifts, I've also, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the times as I'm prepping for this series, I'm thinking about the best gifts I ever got for Christmas. So I, I still have this idea. I, I, I punted today because of the insanity of what I was doing this week. But I do want to have a spot where the kids are coming up, bringing, like, gifts they got for Christmas and trying to do some sort of teaching, you know, a little mini fun thing with that. I still might be bold enough to do that next week. But... Um, when I was about nine or ten years old, I've probably mentioned this here if you've been around me long enough. Uh, it's probably one of my best Christmases ever. But I I loved um, this cartoon, and it, I think it's been on again in a different form, called Voltron, Defender of the Universe. And Voltron was like this kind of like massive robot dude. It was like what the Power Rangers ripped off. For those of you that know Power Rangers, they ripped off a of Voltron. All right, and that's why I hated Power Rangers because it was it was this cheap imitation of Voltron, Defender of the Universe. But anyway, there's Voltron right there, the original Voltron. So there's these five humans, and they, they discovered these ancient like mechanical lions, you know, buried deep in the planet, and they came together to form this this dude, and uh, Voltron. And it, I I was I was just enamored with this. And the coolest part of Voltron every time in a cartoon, like. You fight the big baddie, he, he had the lion heads, he put them together like this, and he'd say, form, blazing sword, and, a, like, and it, it'd like turn into a sword. It was the coolest thing. I was like, oh my gosh, I wish I could do that. So that's why I like Voltron. So anyway, so, uh, but then they had the toy for Christmas. And this is like, you know, back then they had real, real toys. Like they were made of metal. You know, they weren't like cheap plastic that broke all the time. They're made of metal. Um, I just saw that that, Voltron figure on eBay goes for $700 right now. Makes me wish my dad would have let me keep mine. But anyway, uh, now you, I kind of revealed a little bit of the story. So I asked for this for Christmas. I didn't think I was going to get it because it was still expensive then. I wanted Voltron. I also had a, 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 bi- I had a pretty big wish list then. I wanted Voltron, but then they had another Voltron because there's another Voltron that was like like 15 vehicles. And then they would, they would form into, like, three different vehicles for land, sea, and air. And then they'd come together to form another Voltron. They had that toy, too. That was plastic. They had to make that plastic. But I wanted that, too. And then I wanted uh, – I, I was big into Transformers when Transformers were actually metal. Um, so I had a ton of Transformers. But I, at the time, it, revolutionary, kind of hacking off Voltron, but they had a set of Transformers – that were five construction vehicles that turned into one, that came together to form one robot. It was called Devastator. They were, they were the Constructicons for the Decepticons or the evil Transformers. Anyway, so they still have Transformers, but they, they, that was out too. Voltrons were out, Devastator was out, and then they even had Jetfire, which was the huge jet. It was like this big metal jet. It was like this big. It was huge, like, the, most, like Optus Prime's like this big. If you don't know who Optimus Prime is, he was like the leader of the Autobots. Anyway, he's a, so he's this big. Jetfire is this big. I mean, we're talking grant. These are huge items for any of my family to get. I won't tell you what happened because I'm going to save that for another teaching because that's going to deal with a different theme. But for several months, the expectation that I had to get even one of these things was insanity. I'm sure my grandparents thought – I. Th- I'm sure that they probably just wanted to get it for me because they wanted me just to shut up because I wouldn't stop talking about it. And I would, like, I would act it out in my backyards and with my friends. We'd play Voltron and Transformers all over. I'm like, more, more blazing sword, more. And I'd have a stick or something like that. I'd be swinging around when you could do that and hit things. 
Um, it was awesome. But I think about that, and it sounds weird. It's a weird segue and transition to talk about hope that way. But that's what hope is, right? It's this longing or expectation for something to arrive. And what's interesting about it is that um, the, the links that people will go to hope in something. Hope does not guarantee that it will arrive. Hope involves a little bit of faith, which we'll talk about at the end. And so what's interesting is that that is exactly the situation when this gospel was written and this lineage is, is shown of, of that moment of hope. Now, how in the world can you talk about a bunch of names that I probably mispronounced talking about hope? And I know we talk, I, I'm being facetious about talking about hope with toys, although I, I mean, it was very real to me at 9 and 10 years old. I'm not saying you shouldn't hope for those things. But there's other things I hoped for as well. You know, I hoped that my parents would get back together. They were divorced. I hoped my dad would actually come because he didn't get to come that often when I was ages 4 to 11 years old. And there's a story behind that. Not necessarily his fault. Somewhat. I hoped that um, I would be good enough at something. I always didn't think I was good enough. There's lots of things that we hope for, and, I th- and there's still some things today that I, I hope for as well. And this baby shows up in the middle of a time where the Jewish people were about to lose hope. For centuries upon centuries, they've been waiting for a Messiah to come, a promised Messiah from the scriptures, and here we are again under the boot of another empire. And many false messiahs had risen up in the meantime, people claiming to be the messiah and each of the revolutions getting squashed by the Roman Empire. So Matthew writes this huge lineage. Why would Matthew write this? Like, what does it matter? We could take forever walking through each of these names and the stories behind it. You should do that sometime. Look at the stories behind each of these names because it's crazy to think about. One thing the Jewish people were very concerned with in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament as some people call it, is the line of the Messiah. They cared very much about that. And there were laws that would even um, caution people about messing with the line of the Messiah. If there's any possibility, especially when you're talking about pregnancies, and children, you have to be really careful because you don't know if you're in the line of the Messiah. And if you shortchange that in any way, if you try to prohibit that, there's death, literal death that will come upon you. That's how serious they were about the line of the Messiah, this promised Messiah. So here's Matthew going through this lineage, except to a first century person reading this, it's really odd. Because in the Middle East, when you mention lineage, there is never, ever, a mention of any women's names, ever. You know how many Matthew lists in these 17 verses? Five. Five women. To a first century reader, that is odd. It's not only odd, it seems preposterous. Almost to a point where, why would you believe what this guy has to say? Because he's listing women in a lineage? To a Messiah? Come on, this is the Messiah we're talking about. There's no women's names in this. So I thought today, to talk about hope, we need to walk through briefly each of these women because I want to show you why they're mentioned. I'm going to kind of go through a bunch of, like, a little bit of their story and history, but I'll bring it, back, bring it together at the end of why these are mentioned because it's absolutely revolutionary, these women being mentioned. So let's walk through that a little bit. So the first one you, you notice in, in verse 3, the woman Tamar. She's found in Genesis chapter 38. This is a really crazy story. She's married to the oldest of three brothers, if you look at the story, but she ended up not having any children with him. Now, children was like the fundamental purpose of a woman. If you didn't have a child, you're pretty much useless as a woman in, back in that time. I'm saying not now. Don't, 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 don't get ahead of me here. Back then, that's, what, that's how serious it was. She had no children with the oldest brothers, so they couldn't carry on the lineage, right, for the Messiah. There's no way to carry that on. So that's why women are usually considered pointless without having children, or they're very low in the totem pole, if you will. The oldest brother dies. And what's interesting is that in the tradition, what it says 
is that if, the, if a brother dies and you are widowed, you marry the next oldest brother. And that's actually outlined in Deuteronomy 25. You can look it up. I think it's starting in verse 5. My microphone is really cutting out. Do I have to do something different here? Maybe I should just, I don't know. I'll hold it. Um, Deuteronomy 25, you can look that up. I think it's verses 5 to 10, if I remember. And what the term that they usually use for that is called, um, if I pronounce it correctly, because I mispronounce a lot of Hebrew stuff anyway, but um, Leverite marriage, after the tribe of Levi. Leverite or Leverite marriage. So that's the, that's, the, that's the custom. So she marries the second brother. He also dies. And the final brother that's left, the youngest one, he's not old enough to get married. So she can't marry him, so she's going to wait for him. And so she does, and she waits, and she waits, and she waits. And the third brother decides not to marry her, which is against the tradition. You're not supposed to do that. And this is what's interesting, because this story, if you read this story, this is a wacky story. This is a really messed up story. So here's what Tamar does. Because she's supposed to marry this third brother, she doesn't, she concocts a plan to disguise herself as a prostitute. And she woos the father of all of these sons, her father-in-law. And he gets her pregnant. Her own father-in-law. I mean, some people would usually call that incest. That's kind of the name for that, right? And this is a really wacky story because, like, here's what happens and what in the world. And I think what most people don't think about with this story, because it's a hard story to, like, deal with in Genesis especially. And it's really in a weird place, but there's a great purpose behind it. But anyway, because we're talking about the line of the Messiah, but, like, for her, because she's supposed to marry this brother, she's trying to do what's right, and they don't follow through with it, what is she going to do? What rights does she have as a woman? What can she do? Well, she doesn't know. So she did any, she did whatever she could. And that's what she did. It's not exactly the, the way to go, but that's what she did. Like, she didn't, felt like she had a choice. And Matthew mentions her name in the lineage to the Messiah Jesus, Tamar. Then there's a second woman. If you look further down, a woman by the name of Rahab. Some of you know this story in Joshua. Rahab was a prostitute in the, in the city of Jericho. Some of you know about the Battle of Jericho, which really wasn't a battle, by the way. <laughs> That's always funny. It's a Battle of Jericho. The, it, the, there wasn't a battle. Remember, they marched around the city seven times. They blew the trumpets. Everything came falling down. It wasn't really much of a battle to have. But Rahab was a prostitute that housed two of the Jewish spies when they were spying the city because this is the first, you know, kind of entrance to the promised land that God had promised the Jewish people. And Rahab housed them, kind of protected them. But it says in the scripture that Rahab worshipped the God of Israel. Now, we don't know, I mean, we don't know any other details, but it seemed like whatever it was, the way she lived her life, whether she had a choice in that or not, she believed in this God of Israel, and that's why she housed him. And she says, hey, just, just promise, you know, pr pray to your God that he'll spare me when you guys take it, this city. Because she believed that much in, in the God of Israel. Completely, like, foreign to anything that she believed in her own religion. And she risked her life for it. And here she is in the lineage of Jesus, the Messiah, a prostitute which, by the way, is a Gentile. She's not Jewish. She's a Gentile. Third person we hear is Ruth. There's a whole book of the Bible named after her, right? It's a great, it's a wonderful story. Ruth is a Moabite, which is another Gentile, and they are like the sworn enemies of Israel, the Moabites. She's a Moabite woman, and Ruth married into a Hebrew family, where two sons had married two of the Moabite women, including her and her sister. The father and the two sons died. Okay, there's that situation again. And all that's left is the mom, Naomi. And what's interesting is that after all these men died, like, what do these Moabite women do? Well, one of them said, you know, I'm going to stay in my home country. Naomi said, I need to go back home. And then it, Ruth kind of, it's kind of one of the famous things Ruth gets quoted in, in chapter 1. 
She says, your people will be my people, my, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. This crazy sense of devotion and dedication and surrender to the God of Israel and to Naomi. And we later find out she does something similar to what Tamar does, except she didn't pose as a prostitute. She poses as a maidservant, it says in the scripture, and she essentially asked for a Levirate marriage, just like Tamar had done. And she meets a man by the name of Boaz. Some of you know this story, right? Boaz, you know, she kind of does kind of the little disguise thing, and then once Boaz finds out, he agrees to marry her. Ruth is the grandmother of King David. A Moabite woman in the line of the Messiah. Then there's Bathsheba, although you don't see her name in here. This is why you know Matthew really doesn't like her. Right? You hear you hear what Matthew calls her? The wife of Uriah. <laughs> he won't even mention her name. He can't stand her. Bathsheba. Now this story is very famous in Scripture about David and Bathsheba, for those of you who are familiar with it. David's at the top of, you know, at the palace. Bathsheba is bathing in the nude on a roof in view of King David. David sees she's attractive, basically gets her pregnant, sends her husband to the front line to, to die, and then marries her, has a baby with her. Really fun times. Now, David did a pretty egregious act. There's no doubt about it. But what's interesting is that Bathsheba is not innocent either. Because Bathsheba, you know, the thing is about bathing, you, you don't bathe in public. You, don't, you, you have private rooms for that. So to bathe in full view of the palace has to be severely intentional. You have to go out of your way to make sure that someone can see you. And she did. And who knows all the reasons for that. But that's what she did. Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. She, Matthew doesn't even say that she's the wife of David. I mean, he, he, she, he could go that far. No, he won't even do that. But still mentions her. She gave birth to David's son, Solomon considered one of the wisest people ever to live. Not exactly the most upstanding guy either in Scripture, but in the line of Jesus, the Messiah. Now, why in the world would mentioning these women so far give anyone hope? Even though it's preposterous in the, in the, the passage to mention women at all, why mention these women? Because, if I mean, think about this. If you were a woman in the first century, and you heard this, what would you be thinking? I mean, it's, it's just the, it, it's impossible to hear something like this. And then even the examples that were used is strange. Most of the women in the story and the lineage are Gentiles. They're not even Jewish. That's weird. Because, I mean, if you think about the Messiah, it's like the Jewish people are the chosen people. Of course the Messiah is going to come from the Jewish people, which he does. But there's these women who are not Jewish that are mixed in. And they're mentioned. Matthew intentionally puts them in there. Luke doesn't go that crazy. I mean, if you, look, if you read Luke chapter 3, 76 names in, in like five, six verses, they're all men. But Matthew doesn't. Matthew goes and lists five women. We haven't talked about the fifth one yet. They're Gentiles, non-Jewish people. And then you notice that some of the women were honorable. Some of them weren't. Some of them were kind of in between. Right? Like Tamar didn't really do the most honorable thing, but she also felt like she didn't have a choice. What do you do? It's kind of this gray area weirdness. Right? Bathsheba, she definitely wasn't innocent. David obviously wasn't innocent either. Ruth, probably the person that seemed to be the most upstanding, right? I mean, she was very loyal and dedicated. Rahab, a prostitute, but 
it seems like sh- maybe she, for lack of a better sense, converted or reformed her life. Something changed in her with the God of Israel. It's just weird. Like there's some great, some not so great, some in between. Mentions all of them. Then you, then you have the fifth woman that's mentioned, which is Mary, the mother of Jesus, right? I mean, Mary gets pregnant through the Holy Spirit, not through any other guy, which is a problem. Because if people find that out, if people find out that she's pregnant before she's married, because she wasn't married to Joseph yet, it's punishable by death. So if someone finds out how the process works, and then you tell them, oh, by the way, an angel showed up and told me that I'm going to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Like, who's going to believe that story? I mean, seriously, if someone came up to you and said that, would you believe them? No, of course you wouldn't. So Mary is like really hush-hush about it, but she also says, I'll do according to your word. She's like, yep, I surrender, I obey, whatever you say. That was at the risk of her own life, which we also know in the story Joseph takes the same kind of risk by doing what he did. That's not going to be in this series, but so you have, you have this, that's the fifth woman mentioned here. Her name's mentioned. How does this give people hope? Because you realize that Jesus, the Messiah, is the Savior for women too. That he's the Savior for Gentiles too. That he's the Savior for both those who consider themselves saints and those who are sinners. All kinds of people, every person. And I'm not sure if some of the people back then, the Jewish people, thought that was possible. Yet it is in their story, in the Hebrew Bible. They just chose to forget about it. They just chose to ignore it. But Matthew is very intentional to mention these specific women. And if you notice all these women, in whatever ways they were, They were all intelligent, they were all extremely bold, and they were all extremely courageous in what they did. Every one of them. And they are in the line of the Messiah Jesus, the one that we worship. Why does that give us hope? I don't know about you, but I said at the beginning, when I was aching for this Voltron figure, this expectation, I don't, I wasn't guaranteed to get Voltron or Devastator or Jetfire, right? But man, I, I was like, I was just aching inside. And there is, there is a, an, a little bit of faith that I have to have that it will happen because I don't, I'm, I don't, I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't have any certainty that it's going to happen. I have to have faith. That's why I hope, that's why faith is always coupled with hope. Hope is this expectation that something is going to happen. Now, the expectation for the Jewish people is the Messiah is going to come because God promised it. And God never goes back on his promises, but it's been a long time since they've seen that, since the promise was first spoke. And here's Matthew mentioning five women. Women, Gentiles, saints and sinners, everybody in the line of the Messiah the person they knew was the savior of the world, at least the savior of their people. And he shows up at a time that is one of the most tumultuous times in their history. I mean, the baby Jesus is literally hope sitting in front of them in flesh and blood showing up. And Matthew mentions the lineage because the lineage is important. Everyone, remember, they thought the line of the Messiah was very important to them. And he mentions these women to, to recognize that even for them, the hope that they even had was not big enough to what God's promise was going to fulfill. I don't know if you've ever hoped for something and then something happens and it's way beyond what you ever imagined. Has that ever happened to you before? Anybody? That's what Jesus was to the people, to everybody. 
it wasn't just to the Jewish people either, right? We, we've seen the story. To all people. And hope shows up in flesh and blood. I don't care what you're going through. COVID, the death of loved ones as a midst of it or not, whatever, people bullying you, whether adults or children, whether you think you're not good enough, whether you haven't lived the best life that you could, whether you're not in the right class of people, a baby showed up for you to show you that hope is real, that this hopeful expectation of a Savior is here. No matter what you're going through. And God doesn't show up at a distance, does he? He shows up as a human baby. I mean, it's crazy to think about this. God, like God, showing up as a baby who poops and cries. A human being right in front of them. And there's a name that we give him, right? We sing it all the time at Christmas time. Emmanuel, right? Literally means God with us. I mean, that, friends, whatever, the darkest time in your life, whatever it is, or whatever struggles you ever go through in your life, the constant story from Scripture, the constant message that God always communicates is that he is present. He shows up as a baby, for crying out loud. He is with us. He shows up that close. And we know how much farther that baby goes, right? As he, the, the baby becomes a child, the child becomes an adult, and the adult is eventually going to be crucified for the sin of all creation, for our sins, for all of sin, all of the brokenness in the world on a cross, and he's having a last supper with his disciples. I mean, this is hope. This is the hope, and the hope is going to die. And he knows it. And hope looks at them and says, this is my body that's broken for you, this common meal they eat every year. Every time you eat of this, you do this in remembrance of me. And he takes the cup of the blood of the new covenant, and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And every time you drink of it, you do this in remembrance of me. So the, the baby shows up in the scene in the most crazy time, but shows up right in front of them and lives this life in front of them to show them the salvation life. And this ends up leading to his suffering and death. Oddly enough, their own suffering is solved by someone else suffering for them. And it's a reality that he's done this to pay for all the brokenness that's happened, what they're hoping for this Messiah to do. And also an invitation to his followers to say, look, this is in line with the way that I want you to live. And that's why we do this. And sometimes we don't realize that even in the midst of this moment, I mean, think about what this moment is. You're talking about body being broken and blood being poured out, and we look at this as a sign of hope? Doesn't that seem odd? But that's what it is. That's what hope does. It shows up in the midst of the darkest times. It's always been there. So maybe coming to the table this morning for you in this Advent season is recognizing that hope has been here all along. It's just hard for you to see it when you're consumed by all the darkness around you. And yet Jesus shows up right in the middle of it. That's what he always does. And obviously his death wasn't the end. It was the beginning because he rose from the dead. He conquered sin and death. He conquered the brokenness of everything to usher in what we're going to talk about next week, which is his shalom, his peace, his wholeness. God doesn't run away when times get tough, when things seem like they'll never get out of the darkness. No, he's right there in the most surprising of ways, in ways that you never thought possible, in the most unlikely of people, in the hardest of times. So let's pray together as we consider coming to the table.
God, I pray in this moment that we would recognize that hope is always right in front of us. God, I pray as we come and, and take these elements together that we recognize that um, what you showed us in the midst of the suffering is that you are hope. The hope that the world will not be broken forever, that death and sin do not have the final word, that you showing up as a baby is an ultimate statement that you are not running away from us, you're running toward us and closer than we ever thought. And so God, I pray as we come that not only we would remember, but Lord, that we would see the hope that is in front of us each day in the midst of such turmoil. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen.